I saw this 26 tonne jet, 38 foot wingspan, slip under my feet and then go into the mountain and explode. But the parachute didn't collapse. It picked up on the wind and it started, I was two and a half thousand feet up in the mountain and it started dragging me towards the cliff and was pulling me sideways over the mountain with my face going across the rocks and the boulders. So hello and welcome once again to my story and today we're thrilled to have Ian Ferguson with us uh, who has been a fighter pilot. So uh, welcome Ian. Thank you Jack, thank and you very much. We want to know what sort of planes did you fly? <laughs> yeah, well first it's a pleasure to be with you so thank you for inviting me. Um, yes, I've flown a number of fast jets, supersonic jets, uh, some of them that uh, the viewers will know, but uh, basically jet provis, hunters, uh, phantoms and tornadoes, but the phantom and the tornadoes have been the main two mainstays of my 19 year career yes. flying in the Royal Air Force. No desk job, no admin, just flying continuously. So That's it's been amazing. a real fantastic experience. Yes, yeah. was that your um, sort of choice of career when you were a child? It was, yeah. It was my passion from, mm. from probably age of about 10. Born in Oxford, lived in Bampton. Uh, a well-known village by TV viewers that have seen Downton Abbey. Oh, true. So that was filmed in my village of Bampton, Oxfordshire. But right next door was a huge air base, originally the Americans flying B-47s, B-52s, which were incredible. And then the RAF took it over. So having that near inspired me to fly. <laughs> I should think <laughs> so. <laughs> yes. yes. Yeah. So was your family a Christian family? No, they weren't. Uh, we were sort of religious in the sense that when I was young, I was sent to St. Mary's Church in Bampton in the village mm -hmm. uh, to Sunday school with my twin sister. Probably kept going to the age of about 10 or 11. So what training did you have? You have to have a good education at school, GCSEs, A-levels. And I didn't. Oh, really? <laughs> I seriously struggled. I failed the 11 plus, so I went to the village secondary school. Mm -hmm. so I used to sit at the back of the class and read books about aeroplanes. <laughs> but in order to apply to Royal Air Force, I needed maths, English, and some other substantial subjects. Yes. The English was horrendous. I didn't just take it once, twice, three, four, five, six, seven times. I did an A-level or two just to continue to get the, the GCSE English mm. so that I could apply to the Royal Air Force. And I left school when I was 19. <laughs> Bless you. <laughs> it was a struggle. It was a yes. fight. And it left me with a feeling of inadequacy, mm. underconfidence, low self-esteem. Yes. And yet I applied to the Royal Air Force to become a pilot and they rejected me on three separate occasions. And when I asked my father if I would ever make it as a pilot, he said no. Really? And I think oh. at the time, it, it was there was a, a concrete block that just settled in my stomach. Yes. But I imagine? think, having reflected on that, if I'd have been in his position looking at where I was at and what happened to me, mm. I'd have given an honest and truthful answer that in the same way that I don't think, uh, you know, I would have made it as, as a pilot. So I gave up kind of all hope. <laughs> and I worked um, for the Whitney Blanket Company interviewed me three times for whatever reason. And then at the end of it, they said, Ian, we'd like to make you a company executive and train you as in advertising. And I How was wonderful. shocked. Yeah, so I'm kind of shocked. Somebody saw your worth. Yes. What a difference and, it makes. Yes. Mm. And so they said, providing you never ever join the Royal Air Force. Uh, I said yes to the job. Right. Now, what I've found since becoming a Christian, the Bible, every part of the Bible is absolutely true that he does exceedingly abundantly more than we can ever ask or imagine. Yes. But also, before we first love Jesus, he first loves us. Yes. And a year later to the day, a letter arrived from the Royal Air Force saying, Ian, we'd like to invite you to be trained as an officer and a pilot. <laughs> that was the first miracle. How amazing. I'd never applied. No. No, I was just doing my own life in my own way not even interested in God or thinking about God, anything like that whatsoever. Yes. And the letter came. Yes. So, so I'm at this stage, I'm around 20, 21. And I have to tell the managing director, went in, 
knees shaking, literally shaking in front of his desk. And, and all I said to him was, please, sir, would you read this letter? And he stood up from behind the desk and he looked at me with his glasses like that, which scared me. <laughs> and he put his hand out and he said, Ian, I wish you the best of luck. So he released me from my commitment. But what he knew was the Whitney Blanket Company was taken over by Great Universal Stores and closed down two years wow. after I'd left. So yeah, and what happened when you joined the Royal Air Force? Yeah, so the boss took me aside, squadron commander, and he said, Ian, um, you failed the officer training course, but in your case, you can either go back to civilian life or we'll give you one more chance. And I said, I'll do it again. So I did the officer training a second time and I passed it by the skin of my teeth. Um, I failed um, the basic flight <laughs> and it was so bad, <clears throat> right? This is how bad I was at the time. Okay, before God stepped in, I flew a whole navigational sortie, low level. I never checked the petrol once. I was too busy navigating. So my instructor and the squadron commander said, Ian, he said, you can't cope <laughs> with, with flying and doing all the, uh, the checks and the navigation all at the same time. You, you just can't assimilate it all. So we're going to send you to multi-engine transport aircraft. And I said, I don't want to go there. I want to go to fight. He said, no, you're, you're not up to it. So we'll send you on transport. And then another miracle happened. Literally, I arrived at the transport base. And uh, after three weeks, they said, this airfield is closing. All yeah. of you students are going back onto fighters. So, now, I didn't know God. I didn't know Jesus. But I can tell you now, that's never happened ever in the last 50, 60 years. That it's is amazing, isn't yeah. it? Yes. So that gave me a chance yeah. to come back into the fighter stream, which was my passion. Yes. Well, first of all, then, tell mm. us, how did you come to know Jesus? Because it's made such a difference in well, your life. Yeah. Well, literally, that just ties in because I was posted from Oakington, down in the south, up to Leeming in the north. Mm. And a friend of mine, uh, who was nicknamed Ferret, and, and my name, Ferguson, they call me Fergie. So Ferret said to Fergie, let's ring up the nurses at North Allerton Friarich Hospital and ask them if they want to go to nightclub on a Friday night. So I said, yeah, he said, you ring Fergie. <laughs> so I telephoned this girl called Liz. She's now my wife, OK? Uh, I telephoned Liz at the time and said, um, would you and one of your friends like to come out to a nightclub with me? And, uh, and my friend, and she said, yes, I'll go with your friend. <laughs> so I did make a very good impression on the phone, right? Anyway, on the night when she came out, she came out with me, Liz came across to me. And that evening, for the very first time, she said to me, she was a born again Christian. And was I a Christian? Did I know Jesus? And my stupid reply was, I'm an officer, I'm born in Oxford and I'm Church of England. <laughs> it was the most peculiar religious, you know, justification that I can possibly imagine. I had no idea what she was talking about. No. I never heard that you could have a personal relationship with Jesus at all. So I got posted to RF Anglesey to fly the fallen Nat faster jet. But I said to Liz, would she marry me? Because I was in love with Liz and she was in love with me. And I said, will you marry me? And she said, no. So I said, it was really emotional, really, because she wanted a Christian husband. And she knew that I hadn't received Christ as my personal Lord and Saviour. Mm. She'd taken me to church and I'd heard the gospel, I'd heard about Jesus. And so I said to her, what shall we do? And she said, well, she would do her nurse's training and I would go and see how I was getting on with my flying training. And we'd let God sort the rest out. We never telephoned each other. It was just a letter. So we'd write a letter occasionally. And, and I got into such a dark and difficult place at Anglesey because I'd reached the limit of my determination, my striving and my strength. There's no question, I just couldn't take it any further. And because the RF required such high standards in pilots, I knew that they were chopping fellow pilots on the course and that I was very close to being the next one. So at 10 o'clock at night on the 10th of November, 1975, I went to my room and I said, Lord Jesus, 
I can't take this anymore. Would you come into my life and make it better? I've heard that you can be my Lord and Saviour, that you can forgive my sins and turn my life around. Mm. That was 10 o'clock at night. And then I thought, well, God, if you're in the room and you've heard this prayer, would you put me in touch with Liz so I can tell her I've become a real Christian? And the phone went at 10 o'clock at night and Liz was on the other end. Wow. <laughs> because God had prompted her to give me a call. And I told her I'd become a Christian. We got engaged that weekend. And as I say, the rest is, is history. What a lovely story. Yeah, it's amazing yes. what, what Jesus can do. Yeah, but what strikes me, what a witness Liz was in your life. Absolutely. And does that happen these days? I do hope that young people will take that stand and yeah. say, look, I want a Christian husband, I want a Christian wife. Yeah. How did your training go on from that point? Right, OK. God gave me the ability to fly. That, that ability is still in my hands. So I won the aerobatics trophy for the best pilot on aerobatics. And the squadron commander said, Ian, there's been such a, a difference in you. We're going to give you the one airplane you wanted to fly since you were 11 years old. And that's the Phantom Jet. Amazing. So yes. from no hope, hopelessness, yes. to hope found in Jesus Christ. So tell us some of the experiences you've had. <laughs> one that, again, really in inspiring, I think, to me and to know that God takes care of us in the air. Uh, I was doing a, a night check with a, another staff uh, instructor in the back, checking me out for a night sortie. Ian, will you fly a, a single engine approach in the Phantom, which is fairly standard, normal, it's not, not a problem. So I configured the jet, mid-flap, one engine, and uh, I had the right-hand engine at idle and the left-hand engine at full power. And uh, as I was going downwind at night at 1,000 feet, I just felt Jesus say to me, Ian, you've got the wrong engine. And it was impactful in my heart and in my mind. So I said to Howard, I'm just going to swap the engines over. So I brought the right-hand engine up, the spay engine, and I brought the left spay engine all the way back to idle. So I did the single engine approach on the right engine. And we came around finals. We touched. It's a roller, which means we're going to get airborne again. So we powered up, got, just got airborne. I was bringing the left engine up, and it exploded. So had I been relying on that left engine, we would have had to have ejected. But God spoke into my heart and protected me. And we did a real single engine emergency on a May Day uh, and landed safely from it. Tell us about the ejection. Okay, okay. Yeah, so actually I, I did eject. <laughs> and so I brought uh, the engineers, got a funny sense of humour, but they, they presented me with the ejection seat, the actual ejection seat handle that I used on the day plus the cartridges that start the ejection, Martin Baker ejection seat rising up the rails, uh, plus cartridges which fire the canopy clear so the seat can come out, and the other cartridge which fires the parachute out to deploy it quickly. So this started uh, uh, when Liz and I were praying that we might know the exceeding power of God to us who believe. It's yes. straight from a verse in the Bible in the book of Ephesians, uh, chapter 1, verses 19 to 21. Mm. And, uh, and I wanted to know God's power in my life. So yes. wherever I went, I knew God was with me and powerful. And a couple of days later, I took off in uh, as a, what we call a four-ship formation, four phantoms uh, for a practice intercepts, uh, low level over the Pennines. So I'd simulated shooting the first one down, and now I was coming round the back to take the last one out. So I accelerated up uh, in reheat uh, and I was doing 600 miles an hour uh, at low level. Yeah. And all of a sudden, my jet just dipped for the ground. Now, I hadn't put that control input in. So as a flying instructor, I knew that that wasn't uh, right. There's something I need to be, be careful about. So I thought, I'll just ease the, the jet away from the ground. We were still accelerating. The reheats were still in. We were still thundering along. And as I pulled the stick back, the jet suddenly tucked up 40 degrees. Uh, I mean, massively. Within a within, you know, fraction of a second, it just went boom. Uh, and my head went forward. And 8G, so eight times the normal gravity that we sit here at the table, mm. eight times... And so I thought, right, I'll blend it out. So I just moved the control column just a fraction halfway so that if the jet is, is going to tuck up, at least if it goes up and down and porpoises, we'll go away from the ground. But it didn't do that. It just went from 40 up to a 30 
dive and in the canopy instantly within seconds i mean this is in two seconds uh, there was just stones and rocks and boulders no sky no cloud no blue sky nothing uh, and we were going for the deck so I th for an impact so i then pulled the control column back again just to try and bring it up and away from the ground and it tucked up another 40 degrees so i thought i'm out of here so what I did, I just ran the stick forward with the electric trimmers on it, still full reheated. It was still, you know, so quick, so fast, so instant that I ran it forward. I just put one hand, hand down on that. And although it takes 44 pounds of pressure to pull this out of the sea, it, it came out really easily. <laughs> and I'm thinking, get me out of here, get me out of here. So I screamed, ejecting! And, uh, and then bang! Uh, the cartridge had fired, the seat came up. I was looking on the outside of my jet, outside the canopy at 600 miles an hour. If you'd have given me a yellow duster, I could have dusted the outside of it because the adrenaline, time, expansion, everything that was happening in milliseconds. Yeah. And then suddenly uh, the 3,000 pounds of explosive dynamite fired me out from naught to 60 miles an hour in 0.3 of a second. So I came out with my eyes open. I saw this 26 ton jet, 38 foot wingspan, slip under my feet and then go into the mountain and explode. So the fireballs coming up. I'm now tilting back in the seat with the barostat time release units going tick, 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 tick. And my legs are, are, are open in the fresh air and I'm doing nine miles a minute with my legs forward in the fresh air with the seat rotating. And I thought, am I going to live or am I going to die? Um, but I wasn't frightened. I had a complete peace. It sounds unusual, yeah. but in God, I had a complete peace about it because I know that I'm going to heaven. Yes. Uh, so I just trusted in God. And then shoom, the, the, the final parachute from the decelerator chutes opened uh, and everything went peaceful. The fireball was still going up into the sky, was surrounded by black smoke. Um, I went to automatically do the checks. When I put my arms up, only one arm went up. This arm had been snapped in the blast and my personal equipment, my RT oxygen had been wrapped in it and trapped against my chest. My clear visor had been ripped off, my dark sun visor had been ripped off, my oxygen mask had been ripped off, my gloves had been ripped off in the sheer force of the, the ejection at 600 miles an hour. And so I went through the drills, the parachute was all okay. Uh, and then when I looked at the ground, <laughs> I was only on, the, uh, only on the parachute for 20 seconds. So I thought I'll brace my legs for impact so I don't break my legs. Uh, I put my legs together and I've never seen speed like it. I just literally hit, hit the deck and, uh, and sort of bounced forward uh, onto the mountain, into the snow. And I just thought, thank God I'm alive. I'm on the ground. But the parachute didn't collapse. It picked up on the wind and it start, I was two and a half thousand feet up in the mountain and it started dragging me towards the cliff. <laughs> so I'm going, God, save me! And I turned over and I, with one hand, I managed to release the quick release fastening. You're not normally used, uh, asked to thump it, but I thumped it um, because I only had one hand because mm. normally that can wind you. The harness went and I thought I'm free, but I wasn't free because in the 20 second descent, I hadn't released uh, the lanyard and the survival pack. So the, the parachute went out, the harness connected to it, and then the lanyard connected me to the hip, turned me over on my side and was pulling me sideways over the mountain with my face going across the rocks and the boulders. So I screamed out to Jesus again, Lord, save me, and turned over onto my back. And I'd broken my right leg in two places, multiple fractures. So I had one leg, my left leg and my right arm to work with. So I put my left leg in the snow and I could see a fully deployed parachute in the wind, plus my harness, plus the survival pack, which is a, a fiberglass box with dinghy for over the North Sea operations, was hanging in the air and, and I was connected to it. And if I didn't release, I was gonna go over the edge. Mm. So I went up for the Martin Baker clip which was packed with ice. Now, in bare hands, I could feel the ice in it. I went up for a few seconds, fell back exhausted, 
took a couple of deep breaths, went back up for it again. It was still solid and packed with snow and ice because it had been dragged. So I fell back again. I thought, I've got to make it this third time. So I went up for a third one. And as I put my bare hands around it, I felt trickles of water. And then all of a sudden it went ping and, and the whole lot disappeared. So even the stuff I needed to survive with, technically, I was glad to, to let go of. Yes. And, and fell back in the snow. Mm. And I sang to Jesus, be bold, be strong, for the Lord thy God is with thee. I am not afraid, I am not dismayed, because yes. the Lord my God is with thee. Wow, what a testimony. <laughs> <laughs> I prayed I wouldn't be unconscious, have any pain. I wasn't unconscious, didn't have any pain. So the reason for the ejection just was the fact there was an explosion in the fin, which affected the pitch control. We both survived what was and is. Uh, the lowest, the combined lowest and fastest survivable ejection in the history of the Royal Air Force right up to today. That is an amazing story. Mm. Yeah, very moving. Yeah. Even that you had to get rid of all the stuff that you were relying on in Absol order to be freed. Exactly. Yes. And so people today put their trust in, in finance, relationships, yeah. all kinds of yeah. investments. But actually the best one you can invest in is Jesus Christ. Mm. Yeah, so I asked the uh, the doctors if they would uh, take my bed down to intensive care yes. so that I could pray for, for Steve, because I believe God heals yes. and can heal. And it was important for me as his friend and colleague to pray for him. Mm. And as it says, by the laying on of hands, we, the sick will be raised up. So uh, they very kindly did that and allowed me to go into intensive care, just alone with Stephen, to pray a prayer. Obviously, he was unconscious, uh, but I just prayed God's blessing on him and God's healing uh, over him, uh, even though he stopped breathing 33 times over three days. And they said he would be psychologically uh, damaged. He'd never fly again, and he probably wouldn't walk. Now, there are obviously Christian nurses, born-again Christian nurses, born-again Christian doctors and uh, physiotherapists over this journey of, of recovery, which for both of us um, took in the order of nine to 10 months. But we prayed over every step of the way. Mm. We asked churches to pray, particularly for Steve, but to pray over us every step of the way. Yes. And we both went back flying after 10 months. How amazing. So I went wow. back to fly the Phantom. Mm -hmm even though the first sort it was to fly over the crash site. So tell us, Ian, what is God doing in your life now? The Lord laid on my heart that, that I really needed to, <clears throat> to be trained. I, to a sort of pastoral heart, so I, it, there was sort of guidance and direction to become a, uh, a church pastor. Yes. So in order to do that, I went to Bible college for four years. Uh, I did the diploma in theology at the college, and I did a University of London uh, Bachelor of Divinity degree. Mm -hmm. Bearing in mind my educational background from Quite the early so, days, yes. uh, I qualified and uh, I received my degree from Princess Anne. The Lord had just changed me completely. Through the Bible College, I was asked to um, look after a church in, in Grantham in Lincolnshire mm. uh, as an assistant sort of pastor and support them, the senior pastor. So I did that. And the next door neighbour, the Christian pilot, Phil, he came to me and said, oh, there's a job going in the tornado simulator for a civilian instructor. You should apply. You know, and I thought, yeah, because we're still living in Coningsby. So I applied, I got the job. So I then became a civilian instructor teaching both men and women, the first girl fighter pilots, mm -hmm. how to fly the tornado. Yeah. And at the same time, I was looking out at a church in Grantham, nine o'clock at the breakfast table, I just said, Lord, I know you've got something more for me to do. Would you just show me what that is and where you want me to go? And as I prayed that prayer, the telephone went and there was a minister in Blackburn in Lancashire who said, Ian, we've been praying about you and we believe you're the person that needs to come and take on the church in Blackburn. So this is a whole exciting story because we built a relationship with the church God was guiding us towards that. Mm -hmm. So um, I left the simulator and we basically arrived in Blackburn and instantly <laughs> we, we identified and connected, not just with the British people, but with asylum seekers. So we had Iranians, oh, yes. uh, Afghanistan, Somali. Mm -hmm. And so uh, a lot of them had come from Muslim backgrounds. So yes. 
So I had the privilege of leading over 100 Muslims to Christ. Wonderful. And assisting with those that come along to church to find out what the truth was. Yes. About Jesus Christ, about how much he loved them. And uh, what Jesus meant to uh, a born again believer. Yes. So we had Iranian Bible studies. Um, we had Eritrean Bible studies, mm -hmm. which I led during the week. And uh, we've had uh, Pakistani Bible studies as well. How marvellous. So yes. I have it in Farsi, yes. <laughs> Tigrinya, yeah. and uh, an Urdu. Yes. I don't speak any of those languages, so I have an interpreter. Yes. So we just work through it. But there's been some incredible miracles in different people's lives from all over the world that have ended yes. up in Blackburn yes. and come to faith in Christ from different all walks of religions, come to faith in Jesus. And then from there, the Lord called me to a Christian practice called Cornerstone in Blackburn, which was uh, five Christian surgeries. And they wanted to, rather than give people medication, for example, for depression or anxiety, they wanted a chaplain to be in situ to get to the Lovely, root, root cause. Yes. So actually, um, yeah, there was a, an ordered steps and I say that very quickly, but these are seriously ordered steps of God that just guided me into that role. So I served as a, a chaplain in the NHS, in the doctor's surgery, full time, ministering to every walk of life, from suicide to finding furniture, housing, addictions, broken yeah. relationships, mm. abuse, all those kind of things. Please, would you pray for yes, me? Sir. So I want to pray for you. Uh, whether you're feeling inadequate, whether you're feeling uh, in a hopeless situation as I did, I just want to reassure you there is a God of hope. His name is Jesus Christ. He loves you and wants a personal relationship with you, just as he desired a personal relationship with me. And it's by faith and it's by inviting him into your life and into your heart. So let me just pray now. So Heavenly Father, I pray in the name of Jesus that those that are watching, that are affected emotionally or physically or mentally, that Lord God, you're the God of hope, you're the God that heals, you're the God that blesses, you're the God that loves to have a relationship with each one of us. Would you bless each of those that are watching and listening? May they invite you into their heart to know you in a personal way, just as I did, very simply. Lord, come into my life and make it better. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. Ian, thank you so much for sharing your very different story. <laughs> <laughs> I've been sort of spellbound by it, holding my breath almost. Yeah. The bless you, thank you so much. Thank you.